um, cause the patient to mark. Uh, we've reviewed this talk with the RTs already. Um, it's going to be a very basic um, talk. What I would strongly encourage when you are working in the unit is to pull one of us aside and say, can we go over today's x-rays? And um, I think that's the best way of learning. We're going to go through a very, very simple format here. But the way you get better reading x-rays is by you reading x-rays. And the only way you do that, I think, is when we're on service. So when we're looking at an x-ray, um, helping to understand how an x-ray is formed helps us to understand what tissues we might be looking in the x-ray. And when you look at electromagnetic radiation, gamma rays being powerful rays from space and visual light um, being kind of in this wavelength here, um, our x-rays are kind of around this area here. And why is that important? Gamma rays, not good for you. Ultraviolet light can cause cell changes, visible light, not that bad. It's in a serious, um, dangerous part of the electromagnetic spectrum, and therefore x-rays, it's not something that we can walk into and not be protected. Now, an important thing when you're looking at an x-ray is to understand how an x-ray is created. And the best way to think about it is, is that you have a film at some point in orientation to where the source of radiation is coming. And typically, our film is behind the patient, this is our patient, and this is the source of it. But like all things, when it hits something that's a little bit more solid, be it lung tissue or bone, it's going to cast a shadow that's larger than the object itself. Now you can imagine, suppose this was a, a patient's heart and they're lying on the back and the heart is anterior, it's going to cast a shadow that's quite big. But what if we reverse the patient now, they're, they're on their chest, the heart is now very close to the film, the shadow is going to be a lot smaller. The heart doesn't get bigger or smaller, but how it is oriented compared to the source of the radiation and to the film itself may affect the size. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. It's fairly straightforward. So again, here it's illustrated either an AP or a PA film. Again, it's going to cast a shadow, but it's dependent on the position. Okay? Most of our patients, we're going to do AP films because they're going to be lying down, they're going to be on their backs, and we're going to slide the film underneath them. Therefore, the heart is going to appear bigger than um, it ought to, but same with all the other structures as well that are anterior. When we talk about exposure, so we talked about shadowing, size of what we're looking at. The other thing is exposure. And exposure is basically answering the question of how dark something is or how light something is. If you have something that is bright, bright white, that basically tells us that um, it is extremely dense, that not a whole lot of um, the radiation is going to pass through it like a coin. As we go down the densities, for example, like bone, bone is white, but it's not going to be as white as, as a coin. Then you go down even further and you get to the lungs. Well, the lungs ha are primarily composed of the air, but there still is tissues there. It's not nearly as black as the air around the patient. So again, density, the color, tells us a little bit about what we are looking at and what it's fabricated from. So let's do a systematic approach to the next ray. Most important thing, very, very easy, is making certain that you are looking at the right patient on the right day. And we all get caught by looking at an x-ray and saying, oh my goodness, the endotracheal tube has to be pulled up or pushed down, recognizing that that may be the wrong patient or the wrong day. Very, very straightforward, knowing your patient. So, bad things can happen, adverse events. You can pull it out a half a centimeter, recognizing it's the wrong patient, and cause an inadvertent extubation. So, identify. That's pretty straightforward. Dating as well. Um, Finding old films is really, really easy with um, electronic charting. Very important because we can see progression of the films, obviously. And then knowing the technique. Is it an AP or is it a PA? And because we're really talking about chest x-rays, that's really the one question. So who they are, when was it done, and is it an AP or is it a PA? So then the next thing is we've identified that. We, we know we're dealing with the right scenario, the right film. Now we're going to comment on the quality of the image. X-raying is a art. It's not something that we just aim the thing at, we shoot it at it, they can make various adjustments. It's very important that we have a good quality film because if it isn't, it can skew what we're, we're seeing. So one of the first things we look at is, is the patient rotated? 
So again, if I'm going to be rotated like this, but I'm getting a film that's perpendicular to me, one of my chest cavities is going to look a lot different than the other. One of the things you want to note is that our patient is flat. And there's a few ways of looking at it. One of them is the clavicles. And you can see the end of the clavicle is here and here. And you want to make certain that they're basically oriented the same to the vertebrae behind it. If one clavicle is way over here and the other one is over here, you know that the patient is rotated. If the patient isn't rotated at all, the ends of the clavicles should almost be in identical positions to the vertebrae behind it. The other thing that you could look at is you could look at the ribs themselves. And you can see, um, are, do the ribs look the same? When I'm rotated around one of the hemi sides, the ribs are going to be long, elongated, and they look close together, while the other ones are going to be stubby and it looks like they're spaced apart. So again, I look at my clavicles, they are more or less equal, a slight rotation, and I look at the, the ribs on one side versus the other side, and they look more or less symmetrical, okay? So that's rotation. Second one is, do we have adequate penetration? And basically what we want to see is we want to see spaces between the vertebrae. And I see that the spaces are quite obvious here. The last thing I want to look at, and this is a little bit difficult for kids and for neonates, is you want to have nice lung volumes when you do the x-ray. And typically you want to see eight or nine posterior ribs. When, as adults, if we get a chest x-ray, they'll say, take a deep breath and hold it, and they'll do the chest x-ray. We can't do that with kids, particularly kids that are ventilated. So what we want to see is eight or nine posterior ribs. Now, if you think about it, the ribs that you are seeing are the back of the ribs as they're going around to the front. And what, when we count ribs, we often forget the top ribs here. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, and then the diaphragm is about nine or ten. So we have adequate inspiration. The most common thing that people miss is they often miss the first ribs here that are sometimes difficult to see, or they'll start counting anterior ribs. This is the anterior rib here, and then you get mixed up a little bit. So count the posterior ribs, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. So based on the quality of the image, I would say that we are slightly rotated, but it's not consequential. We have adequate penetration because we can see between the intervertebral discs, and we see about nine ribs. Does that seem about reasonable? So I would say the quality of the image is good. So rotated, okay. So looking at clavicles is sometimes difficult, particularly with the neonates, because the neonates are made out of jelly. They're not made out of bones, right? <laughs> and seeing the end of the clavicles is really difficult because the bones haven't completely ossified. Adults, it's very, very easy. But with neonates, you're able to see the ribs. So suppose you don't see the clavicles here at all. Does that look symmetrical or not? No, it doesn't, right? These ribs look a lot closer together. They look longer. These are further spaced apart. Without even looking at the clavicles, unless you have massive scoliosis, you know that you have a rotation problem. The end of the clavicle is here. The other one is here. In relation to the, the spinal cord, you know that they're turned over. Again, older kids, easy. Neonates, not so much. We look at penetration here. We can see the intervertebral discs easily. And let's say the posterior ribs. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine and a half. Penetration is reasonable. Inspirational, uh, inspiration is reasonable, but we are rotated. How about this one here? If we look at the rotation, the clavicle is here and here. This is a perfect x-ray as far as not being rotated. Um, it's difficult to see the ribs, um, but the clavicles are here, so I can say that it's not rotated. I cannot see intervertebral discs or spaces here at all. It is over-penetrated. And as far as inspiration is concerned, I really can't count ribs because I can't see the top one because it's over-penetrated. If you see an x-ray like that, you can say, oh my goodness, bilateral pneumothorax. No, it's not. It's over-penetrated. That's why quality of knowing quality of film is important. So then there's all these different approaches. We've ID'd the patient. We know the date. We know that it's AP or PA. We've talked about rotation, inspiration, penetration. Now what we're going to do is look at the x-ray itself. There's a lot of different ways that we can do it. I typically like to go from the outside to the lungs, so the outside in approach, but there's a bunch of different ways that you can do it. 
I don't want to go to the lungs first because there's a lot, a lot of information that we can get without looking at the lungs that will help um, create the story of our diagnosis. So the outside, I basically mean everything outside the rib cage that we see. Well, we, we look at the soft tissue, and oftentimes in the soft tissue we can see clips, surgical clips. We can see air consistency sometimes around the skin, subcutaneous emphysema, for example. So again, looking at the skin first. Now we're going to look at the bones, and you don't have to know really, really small subtleties, but what we're trying to identify is obvious deformities. So we can start with the clavicle. If the kid has a clavicular fracture, you're going to see that the bone is, is obviously displaced significantly. The scapula is sometimes difficult to see here, and sometimes we think that the scapula is in fact the lung border. But again, recognizing that you can draw your finger around the scapula. Seeing scapular fractures is very, very abnormal unless you have high velocity trauma. So then we go to the scapula, we're going to look at the ribs and we're going to look all the way down the ribs. Very, very important for kids because of non-accidental or child abuse, you want to look at rib fractures. And then finally you want to look at, at vertebrae. Now vertebrae, what are you looking at vertebrae? You're making certain that the vertebrae are above and below one another and you have a nice straight line through the pedicles, that's really all you're looking for. You recognize that they're also rectangular in shape. If you have a funny looking one, um, butterfly vertebrae, you might be able to pick it up. So again, major anomalies are gonna pick up. So you're gonna look at skin, subcutaneous um, fascia. You're gonna look at clavicles, ribs, vertebrae, and diaphragm. Well, what can you get from the diaphragm? The diaphragm is here. In some instances, what you can see is one diaphragm that is flat. Maybe you're going to see both diaphragms that are flat. You're commenting always on symmetry and how it looks, the shape of it. And now what we're going to do is we're going to look at the cardiac silhouette and then the mediastinum. And I'll break every single one of those down. So again, we're doing the outside in first. So let's look at subcutaneous emphysema first. So again, we're looking at surgical clips and we're looking at air. You can see here that we have air density, right, because air is on the lung. It's not as dark as air, but we know we have air in the lungs. And we have this kind of density outside the rib cage. Well, what can that be? The only thing that really can be is air. And if you see it to this degree on x-ray, you ought to be able to feel it as well. So air is trapped in the skin layering, and oftentimes it will raise to the dependent areas. So it may start at the side, but if the patient is sitting upright, it will migrate as air does between the planes and often be around the neck. So when we have a kid, for example, that's being jet ventilated on high, high pressures and something wonky goes with the servos, the one thing that I'll do is I'll feel for sub-Q emphysema because oftentimes that's the first indication. So pneumothorax, um, what can cause this? Um, a pneumothorax, trauma, um, infection, gas, gangrene, never have seen it. Mostly you're thinking about a pneumothorax or trauma. But again, you see this, you should be able to cl clinically feel it. Um, so now we're going to talk about bones. So again, subcutaneous tissues. We go bones, clavicles, ribs, vertebrae, scapula, a little bit difficult. This is why we want to look at all parts. You don't have to be a radiologist to recognize that there are breaks here and not here. We, we're a little bit rotated. You often, you, you see also abnormalities here. If you wonder, is this abnormal or not, all you have to do is you look to the other side and you recognize that they're not there. So again, you don't have to be a radiologist. Symmetry is, is gospel when it comes to chest x-rays, and you can clearly see that these are not symmetrical to the other side, okay? So non-accidental injury. Again, ID the person, date, PA or AP, oftentimes it will say on the film, Let's look at quality. Um, this is a, a two-monther. I'm not too certain where the clavicles are ending, but I'm looking at the ribs. And I would say that the ribs are fairly symmetrical, so the rotation isn't bad. Intervertebral space are being penetrated. That's great. Inspiration, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, adequate inspiration. I look at the, I don't see any surgical clips, I don't see any subcutaneous emphysema, I don't see any clavicular fractures, the vertebrae is nice and straight, I see straight pedicles, I go to the ribs, oh something looks off there, oh I don't see it here, off here, I don't see it here, something wonky is happening here, and how about mid-rib, and I don't see a whole lot of rib fractures here, okay? 
So very, very simple approach. We haven't even looked at the lungs and we're able to pick up something here. So the diaphragm. Um, really the two questions are, are they symmetrical or not? And are they concave or are they flat? Now this is obvious here. I see a nice diaphragm border here. I don't really know where the diaphragm stops or starts here. And I have a whole bunch of junk here. Um, what do you think this is? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So again, a pickup on an x-ray because I'm not too certain. There's not <coughs> symmetry. I don't know where the diaphragm border is here. Okay. So diaphragmatic really good. All right. So now um, we have looked at the sub um, Q. Uh, tissues, we looked at the bones, we looked at the diaphragms, now we're going to look at the heart. And this is kind of a nice way to think of the heart. When you're looking um, at a person, this plane here, you're going to see the right side of the heart. Behind is the left side. It's not like it's diagrammed in a lot of the books that you and I read. The front of the body is the right side heart, behind is the left side. And based on that, really when we're looking at an x-ray, your right side of your x-ray is going to be primarily your right atrium with your SVC. Your blood here that you see here is going to be behind and that's going to be your left ventricle. So this is your left ventricle here. The rest of the marking, your aortic knuckle for example, you don't see nearly as well as you see on adult x-rays, but just think right side of the heart and then left side of the heart here. And all together Again, adult x-ray, you can see the aortic knuckle really nicely on adults and kids not so much. Really what you're looking at is really the size of the RA and the size of the LV. When we talk about the size of the heart, um, it tells us a lot of information, predominantly with the neonates. But anytime you think about congestive heart failure, your x-ray is going to help further your diagnosis. Now, if I look at this x-ray, again, we've done the ID, we've done the date, APPA. Let's look at quality here. Um, I don't see the clavicles. I think I have a clavicle end here or here. But if I sit back and look, my ribs are equally spaced. That looks like I'm not too rotated. But if I look at over or under penetration, I can't see any intervertebral space. We are majorly over penetrated here. Would you agree with that? Yeah. As far as inspiration is concerned, because we're over penetrated, I think the first rib is here. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. I would guess that it's adequate inspiration. I did the sub Q tissues. I looked at the bones as best as I could, but I can't see it. My diaphragms are a little bit flat. Now I'm looking at the mediastinum. So again, trying to go over the approach over and over again. When we start talking about a cardiothoracic ratio, basically what we're looking at is the size of the heart in comparison with the size of the thorax. Now, typically anything greater than 55% is should be further evaluated. Some neonates, for example, you might be able to stretch that even to 60%, but anything over 50, 55% in the back of your mind, you should think something is wonky with this heart. Now, when you go up north to some x-rays um, where it's not digital, you might have to take out a ruler and measure it. If it's electronic, you can use electronic calipers to, to get these two distances. And basically what you want is the most right um, distending point of the right atrium to the apex of the left ventricle and measure that. And then you want to go from one sulcus to another and measure and figure out your ratio. So the mediastinum. So the mediastinum, um, we, 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 we're now done our heart. We've convinced ourselves that our heart is at a good size. Our mediastinum, our structure is superior to the heart in this kind of avenue. Now, why is that area important? Well, one of the things, um, if you're used to looking at adult x-rays, is that if you see something like this, um, you would say, oh my goodness, we're dealing with a tumor here. With kids, kids have a large thymus. Thymus is kind of the policeman in the chest where it's kind of going around and, and, uh, and, and, and kind of sniffing out infections. Your thymus can be very, very big. Not only that, it can fluctuate with the same patient over days where you might be able to see it and then it might get really, really small. The one thing that distinguishes a thymus from, let's say, a tumor, something that we have to worry about, is what's called um, the wave sign and the scalloping sign. And you can see here that... Um, if, and, and hopefully you can see it, is that you've got little blebs like this along the thymus. 
If it was a tumor or something more sinister, it would have straight lines where a thymus kind of has these waves in it. And what causes the waves is that you have lungs that are pushing against the thymus that's pushing against the ribs. And as it's pushing against the ribs, it's causing these wave signs. If you have a solid tumor there, the lungs will not push it to the ribs to cause these conformational changes here. So that's called a wave sign. Now, how about um, air in the mediastinum? We talked about subcutaneous emphysema, but take a look at this. What consistency do we have here? Um, we should be looking at, um, at, at no air, but we have a definite membrane here with air-like density. Again, air-like density, air-like density, air-like density. Recognizing your densities, and your densities here are kind of like lung densities, you can kind of look at this and say there is air where there ought not to be air, right? So again, you might not know what is causing it, but it's very clear in understanding your densities that you have a line here that ought not to be here, and that line is of the density of the air. Okay, a pneumomediastinum. Okay. Um, so for transport, they had that. Yes. What would be your... Well, it depends on the etiology. Uh, was it a trauma, for example? Um, that would be, it'd be difficult to say. And what are you going to do about it? Um, you're not going to put a chest tube in a mediastinum. No. Um, but I would look for, if it's trauma, for example, I would look to see if there is um, air in the lungs as well that would warrant a chest tube. Um, there's a lot of different etiologies for pneumomediastina, but if it's in the context of trauma, then I would definitely look at other areas in the chest and body that have been exposed to that sort of energy. Yes? Uh, bed 9 right now has a pneumomediastinum, so if anybody's in the unit and has a chance to look at the x-rays. Bed 9 uh, on oscillator? Yeah, okay, so again, high pressures, right? And um, Anytime you see a pneumomediastinum, it's an indicator that something more sinister is happening. You can't put a tube in there, but you have to correct whatever is causing it. So just requesting a ground cabin? Potentially, yep. Yeah. yeah, potentially. If you, well, if, you, if this is on a trauma, for example, I would look for a pneumothorax. If a pneumothorax is there, I would put a chest tube. Yeah. If you're in nowhere, Manitoba, and you have to fly, then mm -hmm. I would probably think about pressurizing to take off uh, altitude. Absolutely, because this is going to get bigger. Yeah. Not only is this going to get bigger with altitude, this might just get bigger with the underlying process that's there. So this could be dicey. So the question is, if we use air, we'll be able to get the kid quicker to HSC at the risk of this getting bigger in a shorter time. Or if we don't know what the underlying etiology is and go ground, which might be three times longer, this might get bigger just because uh, the underlying etiology hasn't been addressed. And There's so these, many places we go where you couldn't come back ground. That's it's so. Yeah. It's sometimes, yeah, yeah, these are the difficult scenarios. Yeah. 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 No. Uh, last time I went to Fort Francis, I think uh, we had a 32 week or had our newer meter starting from over and like, like yeah, hand Once we integrated to resolve it, mm -hmm. oh, and uh, we were able to bring it back. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. it all depends on the... I know, I hear, it's a good question. Um, it ain't perfect, I'll tell you, sometimes, yeah. right? That's, that's, what, that's why you guys are doing this, because you're renegades. <laughs> that would be on phone in that situation. <laughs> no, but seriously, you get in uncomfortable positions where you have to guess what is the lesser harm to the patient, and uh, mm -hmm. it's suboptimal, and that's a good, good point. I, sometimes, I don't know what the right answer is. Now we're talking about the lungs itself. So again, ID, date, position, rotation, penetration, inspiration, sub-Q, bones, heart, mediastinum. Now all of a sudden we're going to the, uh, the lungs. But we can think about the lungs rather than just looking at them. Let's look at the large airways first. So trachea, left and right main stem, and kind of the bigger ones, the first few generations. So let's go from there. Number one reason why we look at an x-ray is at a tracheal tube position. And uh, this is usually very, very easy to see unless we have a bunch of other hardware that's in the way. But we're able to be able to see the carina. Recognizing uh, where the carina is, we can pull back and, and proper position depending on the age is anywhere going to be between T2 to T4. I don't really hold this so much because we deal with kids with abnormal airways. I typically look at the carina. And I want to be above the carina and be in a place where I can have patient movement, where I'm not bouncing off of the carina. 
But if you only look at, say, I'm going to do it to T4, I'm going to do it at T2, I think that we don't um, keep in mind the individual airway differences of our patients. So we'd be able to see the carina, and here you can roughly see the right main stem here, and you can see that the tube is right at the carina. Okay? Um, the other thing by looking at it, here you can see the carina very obviously here. You can see that the carina is not in midline, and the right and the left are well beyond midline. But when I see an x-ray like this, the first question I think is, before I'm going to put a needle in there and decompress, is the patient rotated? And that's why it's so important to go through the things that I talked about, because the last thing you want to do is put a chest tube in a patient where they were completely normal but just rotated. So if I look at this, so again, name, ID, PAAP, again, you'll, you'll say that on most x-rays, and let's look at rotation. So I have one clavicle here, one clavicle get there. That looks pretty reasonable looking at the pedicles of the, uh, of the spinal column. I am adequately penetrated and one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Quality of the film is great. So when I see that, without even looking at this bugliosis that's happening here that's really obvious, I can assume that my shift here is, is real, it's not because I've rotated. Okay, does that, again, always going through the simple things and reinforcing it to make certain that we're, this is obvious, but oftentimes it's not that obvious. Okay, so now we look at, we took a look at the trachea, the right and the left. Now let's look at the lungs itself. And, uh, the last thing we're going to look at is the lungs itself, which is most of the time why we want to do the x-ray, but again, reinforcing our process over and over again. Now, there's kind of two patterns that we can see when we're looking at the lung parenchyma. And one is airspace disease, and uh, it typically has its own pattern, and then we'll look at another pattern after that. Now, if we take a look at this, we've done all the quality, we've done everything. Now, let's, um, let's look at the airway first. So, this is our trachea our right and our left you really can't see and one of the reasons why you can't see is I don't see the intervertebral discs very well so again by looking at this x-ray it's obvious that something is going on but I don't see the carina because we are over penetrated so we look at the proximal airway difficult to comment now let's look at the distal airway and really what it boils down to is symmetry okay now what is going on here just somebody blurt something out what is abnormal here? There's something in the right. On the right side. Yeah, there's something weird here, right? Yeah. This is normal lung. That's what lung should look like. Mm -hmm. There's something here, the type. Now, I know that it's something bad because if I had a pencil, I couldn't with certainty draw my pencil where the line is. It's kind of a little bit scattered. That's the first thing. Some pneumonias are really, really consolidated where it's very, very clear. But I have a difficult time drawing my pencil around here. Not only that, I really can't see my right atrium very well. The right atrium kind of bleeds into this blah, what's going on here. So this is abnormal. Compared to this side of the heart here then, again, so you think, okay, I, I, I remember this talk. I haven't seen a lot of x-rays. I remember that Greg was telling me that symmetry is kind of God. Well, take a look at here. We've got nice lungs of the right density, right? Uh, not as dense as bone, but denser than pure air. If I had a pencil, I could draw the cart and the mediastinal border very, very well. And I look at that and I ask myself, are these the same? And it's obvious not. There's something going on in the right upper lobe, I would say, right? If you want to say maybe extending to the right middle lobe, go crazy. But we are obviously that we have a process going on there. So more airspace disease again. So we talked about pneumonias. Um, we're going to talk about atelectasis. So atelectasis again is volume loss. The interesting thing with atelectasis again is that we, we, we've gone through our whole x-ray. We're looking at right versus left and we recognize that something is here. But when we look at that, we're like, well, is this a pneumonia? I, I don't know. Like something obviously is going wrong here. Is this a pneumonia? Well, again, if I took a pencil, I can draw, here's my, uh, my mediastinum, I think. I can draw it around my right atrium, but I can draw my line here. There's a distinct line here. What is that? Is this a pneumonia process going on? Well, maybe. So this is where your history comes in. This is where your physical exam comes in. Is the patient a kidney? Do they have fever? Do they have work of breathing? 
If I do this, for example, one of the things that I'm thinking about is atelectasis. I have got an absolutely straight line here. What is that straight line causing? As you know, on your right side, you have your right upper and your right middle lobe. And normally your fissure is a straight line here. And normally you can't see your fissure unless you have fluid there. I have an obvious straight line. What is causing that? Either it's an ammonia with a crazy straight line pattern, or I've collapsed my right upper lobe, and by doing so, what happens to my middle lobe? It starts okay. taking the space up, and I get a nice straight line because of that. Atelectasis. Well, you would get a history different than a kid with, uh, with, with really bad pneumonia with atelectasis, right? You might have a kid that has coughs, cough, cough, cough. You might, when suction, bring up these big mucus plugs, for example. There might be other reasons of having atelectasis. Um, fever always with pneumonia. Maybe not fever here. Who knows what's causing that? But you've got a straight line. And like I said, in medicine, straight lines typically are not physiologic. And a straight line is likely caused by a lung that's trying to make, make space. So this is kind of what I'm trying to explain here. Your horizontal fissure, you have atelectasis in your right upper lobe, and it's just going to migrate trying to take that space in that hemithorax. Now, conversely, if you have right lower lobe collapse, what's going to happen? You have volume loss here, and now all of a sudden my horizontal fissure is going to move down because my right middle lobe is going to start basically taking this space where my, my lower lobe was. Okay, so... Again, airspace disease, or parenchyma, you have airspace disease, two types of airspace disease, pneumonia, clinically very easy to pick up mostly, atelectasis, and now what we're talking about is interstitial disease. Now when you look at this x-ray, again, we've gone through all the quality checks, the ID checks, everything. If you only look at the lungs, for example, and you look back, you may have to look at a lot of these x-rays, you see chronic -y, yucky, kind of old man lungs kind of thing. These are lungs that we kind of see in our cystic fibrosis patients as well. And you have to see a lot of x-rays. Um, if you take a look at this, for example, this is um, the penetration isn't bad. We see streaking of airways, of blood vessels. You've got kind of a, a uniformity where when you go to this x-ray here, you kind of see a bunch of these cloudy poof poof period areas. You see these circles forming here. These are really, really bad chronic disease lungs. And there's a nice little drawing that I found here because I have no way of being able to describe it where you have these nodular patterns or these reticular nodular patterns. So if you take a look at these drawings, for example, and then you superimpose them on here, you can kind of appreciate that there's a consistency to these lungs that is abnormal, okay? Um, the other one, so we talked about interstitial disease, now we're going to talk about pulmonary edema. We talked about pulmonary edema in our cardiac talk as well. Again, by looking at this film, let's, let's do this from top to bottom here. We, we'll look at the ID, we'll look at the date. Um, the the x-ray tells us that it's AP, so the x-ray is here and the film is behind the patient. Let's look at quality. Again, this is a young patient. Clavicle is very, very difficult to see, but if I look at the symmetry, it looks like the patient isn't rotated at all. Intervertebral space, yes. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11. The patient is hyperinflated. Sub-Q, I don't see any evidence of sub-Q emphysema. I don't see any clips. I look at the bones. Um, I don't see any evidence of rib fractures. The the vertebra are nice and straight, the pedicles are in line. Um, I look at the diaphragm and they are a little bit flat. I look at the heart and the heart looks massive to me. I look at the thymus or the, the mediastinum and I see some scalloping here, so I believe that that's thymus. I look back, proximal airway, your carina is here, it's not shifted or moved. And now I'm looking at the lungs itself and what I see here is curly lines, and I'll, I'll explain what curly lines are later. But if we hadn't gone through that whole process, we would have missed a heart that was really, really big. And of course, you look back and you say, there's no way I would have missed it, but if we don't have a way of checking everything, we're gonna miss things. So you have a really, really big heart, so the next thing I'm thinking about is failure. Right ventricular failure, left ventricular failure. With left ventricular failure, I'm gonna to expect to see fluid backup, and what you'll see is curly B lines. These are curly lines here. Curly A and curly B lines. What they are are straight 
kind of um, markings, vascular markings on the very, very edge of the lungs. Or sometimes what you can have is perihilar markings like this. And so I'll go back to this x-ray here and um, you would be able to appreciate, um, do I have a closer, another one of that? There we go. This is a better one here. Beautiful lung markings. Beautiful lung markings at the absolute extremes. You should not be seeing anything at that far of an extreme. So curly B lines, and then you have curly A lines, again, horizontal lines coming out of the perihylum. These are very, very difficult to see, but anytime you have straight, line, uh, straight markings at the extreme edges of the lungs, in the context of heart failure, you're gonna worry about volume overload. Why is this important? Well, when we look at volume overload, oftentimes we're looking at fluid at the sulci here, or fluid at the fissure. Oftentimes these come very, very early. So again, another nice little drawing here about what our common lung processes are. Consolidation or Fars pneumonia, um, oftentimes difficult to draw a pencil around, kind of fluffy, obscuring the heart margins. Um, nodules and mass we didn't talk too much about. Atelectasis, we have collapse and subsequent um, taking over by the other lobes for that space. We can find interstitial patterns um, that are reticular nodule or nodular, and then these curly B lines right at the extreme lung edges. Okay, so now it's going to be fairly, uh, not yet, right after this it'll be your turn. So now, ID, quality, everything but the lungs, proximal, distal airways. Now the last thing we're going to look at is the pleura, the extremes of the lungs. And one of the things we're going to look for is fluid. Fluid between the ribs and the lungs effusions. And as you can see right here, compared to this lung that you've, you've got nice lung markings all the way to the edge of the thorax, you can see here obviously that something is going on. Okay, it's an effusion. Um, you look at this patient here, and this is a little bit more difficult in that, um, again, we've done all our check, everything looks good, right side looks good, symmetrical left side. Now this is very, very difficult. When you look at an effusion here, um, you, can, you can clearly see that this isn't a pneumothorax because a pneumothorax would be air colored, right? So this is white that's pushing in, so that's an effusion. But what about here? So if I had a pencil, I could draw the RV, RA line very nicely. Here I come down mediastinum and then I can't draw a pencil anyway. This whole right or the whole left side um, doesn't look very good at all. The problem with it is, is this a really, really bad pneumonia or is there an infusion on top of this? And we don't really know. It's because the patient is upright. And so sometimes it's difficult to diagnose an effusion because it's hidden behind a patient that has a bad pneumonia. But if you can look right here, you can probably start to appreciate that there is, mm -hmm. the effusion is probably at this level. And you could probably even follow a whole fluid level that's here. So when you see something like that as a whiteout, it could be a really bad pneumonia, an infusion always keep in the back of your mind. Pneumothorax is very, very easy to pick up if they're large. They're a little bit more difficult to pick up if they're small. From a transport perspective, as we talked about earlier, this pneumothorax is gonna get even one and a half times bigger if you decompress, or if you compress, sorry, to 6,000. So small amount of air, this is actually quite a bit of air, is gonna get bigger and bigger when you're up in the air. Very, very easy to see here. Oftentimes it's a lot more subtle. Now, the last thing is a costophrenic angle blunting. So again, as we, as we follow the pleura, we're looking for effusions, we're looking at air there. If we go here to the costophrenic margins here, you can see that there is blunting here. Typically they should be deep, it's called a deep sulci sign, but you can see here that there's a little bit of blunting and a little bit of blunting. Again, another sign that there is fluid here and they're just going to the deepest recesses in the thorax. Um, foreign bodies, um, the last thing kind of you can do this at the beginning or the end is, uh, is looking at all the hardware, endotracheal tube. This looks like a, uh, a line that's uh, right in the SVC. 
this looks like probably an, an NG tube. So being, a, 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 being able to account for all the foreign objects that we place. But of course also thinking about foreign bodies that can get the patient quite sick. Um, a coin, for example, in the kid, very, very easy to pick up, stands out. The question is, is this in the esophagus or is this in the airway? Anytime you see a coin that's faced like that, is likely um, in the esophagus or just above the airway. Because if it was to enter the airway, it would have to take a 90 degrees and go in on the skinny side to go between the cords. So here, there's no way that it's gonna plop through the cords that way. It has to be on edge to drop through. So if you have a patient with respiratory distress and you see this, to me I'd be like, oh goodness, this is, this is gonna be tough. But you can be a little bit assured that that's probably not below the level of the cords. Not saying that that's a nicer thing, but at least it's not in the level of the cords. Because if you go in there and try to scoop it out, you might push it into the cords. So, uh, but this is um, in the esophagus or the hypopharynx. Again, central line here. Um, be accustomed to be able to account for everything that you see. Um, so let's talk about common being common here. Okay, so somebody, uh, we did with this with the artiste, can somebody um, go through the whole image right from ID to diagnosis. One of the nurses, because our RTs have done this before. So you check your uh, So first ID. Oh. 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 Oh.